The second that you're in a situation where you're procrastinating or you're thinking negative thoughts, it's your subconscious that's in charge of you. And so in order to change, you have to interrupt subconscious patterns. You see, the five second rule isn't just some dumb counting backwards thing. It is a form of metacognition that interrupts the pattern stored in your subconscious brain. Counting backwards requires you to focus, which flips on your prefrontal cortex. It gives you a moment of control over what you think and do next. That's the genius of it because it is simple. You remember it and it immediately interrupts the negative and suicidal ideations that torture people. And speaking of suicide, we know of 111 people who have stopped themselves from taking their lives by 54321 asking for help. So I am here to tell you, I want you to try it. I want you to share it with people because interrupting the patterns of thought and behavior that are holding you back and pushing yourself to take action or to think something different, it is the only way you are gonna change. And this is a tool that's gonna help you bridge that gap. And if you program your mind correctly, and if you're clear about what you wanna create, your mind will help you get what you want. The Rich Roll Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. If, 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 if you struggle with things like self-confidence, finally making those life changes you know you need, if you struggle with finding your purpose or if just the vernacular around self-improvement, words like motivation, inspiration, and passion leave you more confused and deflated than empowered, you are in the right place, my friends, because today's guest, the queen of grounded science-backed personal development, my friend, Mel Robbins is here today to sort you out. Chances are, if you're at all online, you already know this woman, she's like everywhere. But if her name doesn't ring a bell, Mel is a former lawyer turned CNN legal analyst, turned tons of other jobs, turned mega best-selling author, talk show host, and one of the most widely booked public speakers in the world. Her work includes the global phenomenon, the five second rule, Her podcast in Audible is number one on that platform. And her videos all told have over a billion views, including not the least of which is her TEDx talk, which is called How to Stop Screwing Yourself Over, which is one of the most popular TED talks of all time with over 27 million views. Mel is an absolute powerhouse and it's all coming up in a few, but first. We're brought to you by my favorite, super nutritious, crazy delicious, take it everywhere I go. Athletic Greens, the all-in-one superfood staple that makes comprehensive daily nutrition a snap, a snap, I say. In a nutshell, Athletic Greens is one thing with all the best things, just one tasty scoop of AG1. AG1, that's a new term, right? Well, AG1 is Athletic Greens 53rd formula iteration over a decade of constant improvements. And it contains 75 bioavailable vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients to support energy and focus, aid with gut health and digestion, and support a healthy immune system. I am obsessed. I've been a loyal and devoted and dare I say fanatical user of this product for years. I can't say enough good things about it. It is the one thing I make sure goes down the gullet daily to ensure that I'm firing on all cylinders. It's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free or gluten-free, it tastes good. It's got no gross additive nonsense, of course. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give all you guys an immune supporting free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase when you visit athleticgreens.com slash richroll today. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash richroll to take control of your health and give AG1 a try. While we're on a self-care tear, let me just say that, I don't know about you, but for me, when I get stressed, which is more often than I care to admit, 
I find it almost impossible to focus on getting shit done. Everything, even minor tasks, just feel like a ton of bricks on my back. But I have learned mostly the hard way that in these moments, you gotta reset the operating system. You gotta get quiet, you gotta focus on the breath. And to make this process easy and guide me through the hard drive reboot, I found that Calm, the number one mental wellness app, is extremely helpful and effective. Calm has an extensive and constantly updated library of guided meditations, curated music tracks, sleep stories for the insomniacs, and a ton of other great resources to just help reduce stress, increase concentration, and just make your life experience better. Look, even if you're brand new to meditation, the Calm app is super approachable. I often recommend it to people who are just dipping their toes in it for the first time, especially because if you go to calm.com slash rich roll, you'll get a limited time offer of 40% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes hundreds of hours of programming, again, with new content added every week. Over 100 million people around the world use Calm to take care of their minds. Sleep more, stress less, live better with Calm. Go to calm.com, C-A-L-M dot com slash rich roll. That's calm.com slash rich roll for 40% off unlimited access to Calm's entire library. Okay, Mel, Mel Robbins. So the official occasion for this conversation is Mel's brand new book. It's called The High Five Habit, which you should all pick up. It's basically a toolbox for how to make believing in yourself a habit so that you operate more empowered and with greater confidence. But this conversation is about so much more. It's just packed with practical life altering science and experience-based wisdom and tools that you and myself included really need to hear. Nobody, and I mean that, nobody loves making a real difference in people's lives more than Mel. I adore this woman and I'm pretty sure you're gonna fall in love with her as well. So let's cultivate that bias for action, shall we? And do the thing. This is me and the wonderful Mel Robbins. It's good to have you here. Delighted to be in your presence. This has been a long time coming. And I was trying to remember the last time I saw you and I'm pretty sure we were talking about this before the podcast. I'm pretty sure the last time I saw you was on the set of your television show, literally like maybe a week or two before everything locked down in the pandemic. I think days began. I think so, right? Days. Because your show ended very abruptly Mm -hmm. shortly thereafter Mm -hmm. as a result of that. Yeah. Wow. They found, uh, I'll I'll never forget it. So it, it had always been a lifelong dream of mine, growing up watching Donahue and Oprah Winfrey. I grew up in the Midwest and I'd come home from school and they'd be on television. It had always been a dream of mine to host my own daytime mm-hmm. talk show. So when the opportunity presented itself, when I was 50 years old, I jumped at it. It was not the right fit for me at all. In what way? Um, you seem pretty at home. On a television set? Yeah. Well, I'm at home a kind of creating something and working with a big group of creative people. And I love helping people and I love live coaching. That That is really something that it just brings me alive. Mm-hmm. What I didn't like is ever since I've been an entrepreneur. So for the last eight years, 10 years, as I've been kind of recreating myself and building my career, I've been in control for better or worse of everything that I do. Mm-hmm. When I signed on with Sony Pictures Television to do a daytime syndicated talk show, I was profoundly fucking naive (laughs) about just how much was out of my control. (laughs) And also Rich, how much I fucking hate being out of control in terms of not having the final say in what I'm doing. Well, if anything, it it confronted you with that I don't want to say character defect, that predisposition, right? That you had to work through. Um, I mean, it's a machine. There were so many people there. It's crazy. I mean, it was a sight to behold just knowing you and then being there and being like, wow, like this is an operation. Well, here's what I learned about myself. So I personally believe that absolutely everything that is happening to you 
is preparing you for something that's coming. Mm -hmm. And if you look back in this moment, Rich, I know that you can look at all the moments in your life and you can see how those dots connect you to this moment. There was a lesson, there was an experience, there was a person, there was something, even in the worst moments. And I know you Mm -hmm. sleeping on that mattress, you know, at the worst moments of your life in that apartment when you were still practicing law and barely, barely hanging on. There was something that you learned from that experience that you probably still use at this moment in your life, correct? Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, I mean, I have all kinds of um, things I wanna say about that, but before I do that, I'm gonna put on my <laughs> Mel Robbins glasses. <laughs> they're, not, they're not black, they're like brown, but they're the closest that I have. So they I'm are great on looking on you. Um, yeah, it, it, it is, I think part of that also, it, you know, we're around the same age. When you get to a certain age, you're able to cast your gaze backwards and see how everything kind of conspired to create the person that you are today. And it all makes perfect sense through the rear view mirror. And what's interesting is that although our journeys are very different in many ways, there's so much overlap in the variety of experiences that have brought us to this place. I mean, law school, being a lawyer, being an unhappy lawyer, uh, you know, whole financial dismantling, being the parent of, of young adults and et cetera, and all of that, you know, that, that, that comes together. But when I look back on my life, yes, all these different things that I did that seem to not be related to each other or didn't really uh, appear to have any, you know, kind of stickiness to anything that I do now, of course, they all inform, it, it all, it was this perfect soup that has allowed me to be able to kind of do what I do now. And it's certainly the case in, in, in your story. Yeah, and you know, I think life is not really meant to be enjoyed. It's a school. How dare you? What do you mean, how dare you? Not meant to be enjoyed. Well, you can enjoy it. Yeah. But life is school. Mm-hmm. And it's there to teach you something. And maybe it took me 50 years to figure this out and to be able to look backwards and see how the dots connect. But I think the real secret is to be able to stand in the moment today and have faith that this is yet another dot that is leading you somewhere that you're meant to go. Right. And that attitude is what got me through, uh, first of all, this past year, which has been the, one of the worst years of my life, I can't talk about most of it because the attorneys would start calling. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. <laughs> or my kids might hear uh-huh. some of it and they can't know. Um, but you know, the talk show, for example, when I went into it, this is what I said to myself. I've got an opportunity to go after something I've dreamt about since I was a kid. And I know it's not about a show. I know that this is an experience that is preparing me for something else. And having that sort of this is a dot on the trajectory and the map of my life allows me to detach from the outcome. Mm -hmm. Because let's face it, the show was not a success. I got fired from my dream job. It did not get renewed for season two, which means it was a failure, but I don't relate to it that way because I know that it was in my life to give me an experience. And the experience taught me this. I am a horrible CEO. I am terrible at running a company. I am amazing if I can have an organization around me that allows me to show up and do what I do best. I left that talk show having been fired from my dream job, realizing I was in the wrong seat in the bus in my business and that I had to change absolutely everything if I wanted to be happy, if I wanted to work in a way that was effective and if I wanted to really reach the goals that mm-hmm. I have. Did you have that awareness in the moment or is that in retrospect that you're able to develop that? Sense? I had that experience as I was hosting the talk show because it was the first time that I was surrounded by expertise. I have built my business in spite of myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you took your executive producer with you, right? Yes. In the wake of that. Yes, and you know what's interesting? She's a genius. She is the Mindy Borman, um, absolutely amazing human being. And what she learned stepping into digital is that she was in the wrong place. She kept Mm -hmm. saying, I feel like a whale in a swimming pool. I feel like a whale in a swimming pool. You see, I loved having 131 people around me and having a very specific narrow role 
in the making of something, she realized stepping into a team of 10 people that she needs a big team Mm. to work in. Mm -hmm. What I realized from the experience is I need a team of experts around me. Right, and prior to that, you were building your social media empire and becoming this (laughs) lauded (laughs) lauded public speaker and writing all of these books and doing it with a team of people, but also in a manner in which it was not sustainable because of your control issues and trying to manage all these people, which is not a skill set. I think you would admit is, is speaks to your strengths. And the lesson, I guess is what I'm saying from the talk show was, oh, I need to surround myself with people who are better at these respective roles than I am and have somebody who's in charge of managing them for me. So Correct. I can do my thing. Yes, right? and somebody strong enough to just smack me across the face when I'm stepping mm-hmm. out of my lane and stepping into every other lane. Sure, but then the pandemic comes, Ooh. slaps you in the face and then you're just at home with nothing to do and nowhere to yeah. go. Yeah, so, You know, we haven't gotten into this yet, but I have had a lifelong history with anxiety. I was a worrier as a kid, Mm -hmm. um, homesick at every camp that I ever went to. In fact, when we went to sixth grade camp at my little public high school, go away for like five days, I was so disassociated and freaked out so badly that I lied to the camp and told them that my grandmother, there there had been some sort of family emergency. First, I get them to um, let me use the camp phone so I can call my parents. Then I hang up and tell them that there's been a terrible uh, tragedy in the family and that my grandmother has fallen gravely ill, Uh (laughs) convincing my parents to show up. And then when my parents show up and my friends ask me, why are you leaving early? Uh, I lie to them and tell them, you know, that there's been this emergency and that I have to go. When in fact, my panic and anxiety uh, drove me to great lengths to get out of that situation. Mm -hmm. And so when I say I struggled with anxiety, I mean, I was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder when I was 22 years old in law school. That should have been a hint that I didn't like law school, right? Mm -hmm. But I went on Zoloft and I took it for two and a half decades. And I only came off it when I discovered the five second rule and started using it to change my physical habits and then my mental habits. I stopped taking uh, Zoloft when I was 45 and hadn't been on it for, I don't know how old, 52, seven years now. But when the pandemic hit and I was suddenly off airplanes and I was no longer racing around from a speech or wherever, and I had to sit and be with myself, that came roaring back in. Yeah, terrifying. And what I realized is I never understood how dysregulated my nervous system was. And it was having to be still that made me realize that I literally will dart to Target or run to a coffee shop Mm -hmm. or make a phone call or swipe through social media as a way to distract myself from having to just be. Even though you have a husband who's a Buddhist (laughs) and an avid meditator. Well, that's his Buddhism and meditation does not uh, smooth out my dysregulated nervous system. You're not absorbing that by osmosis. No, it's the reason why we're still married. (laughs) He would have divorced my ass a long time ago if he wasn't meditating and Buddhist because he wouldn't be able to deal with me. My favorite, story about your anxiety is in the new book, which we're gonna talk about, The the High Five Habit. (laughs) And it's the story of you getting the job with the Michigan AG (laughs) and being assigned to write this paper on recidivism and just not doing it at all. And then the day that you're called into his office, just not showing up and completely ghosting him. Yes, (laughs) yes, it's true. Like when I think back to what a train wreck of a human being I was, Mm -hmm. I cannot believe I made it through college and law school and basically was upright for as long as I was. I, I the, the story that Rich is talking about is um, at this point, I was not diagnosed with general uh, generalized anxiety disorder. I was just a person who was a complete fuck up. Mm-hmm. I was drinking too much, trying to regulate my nervous system. I hated law school. So I go home for the first year summer. What did you do your first year of law school for? I worked for a nonprofit in San Francisco. Did you know 
when you were terrible. in law school that you didn't wanna be a lawyer. 100%. Yes, and I think so many people get into this position too, whether you're in a relationship or a job or a major or a neighborhood or whatever, where you know you're in the wrong place. Right. But there's so much inertia behind it. And the idea of stepping out of it is so fraught and terrifying that it's easier to just keep going. I mean, I would say, I actually enjoyed being in an academic environment and I needed, I was coming out of living in New York City where I was just a wild man. And I, I needed some of that structure because I knew what to do every day. Um, and I was capable in that regard. So I actually didn't mind like going to class and the kind of, you know, sort of social environment that it provided, but I had no interest in being a lawyer. I Me didn't either. even know what that meant. Even when I graduated from law school, I still didn't know what being a lawyer meant. It doesn't really teach you that part. Well, I guess, because there's so many things that you can do yeah. being a lawyer. Yeah. But so back to the summer, I'm living back home in Western Michigan. I grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, and I'm driving 50 miles a day each way to go to the attorney general's office in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And at the very beginning of the summer, the AG selects me to do a massive research paper about recidivism rates in the state of Michigan. Basically, he wants at the end of the summer, it gets worse. He wants to make a massive speech mm -hmm. about how he has been responsible for lowering recidivism rates, which basically means the rate of reentry to jail, rearrest and reentry. For those of you that are not criminal defense attorneys or study this thing. I had no idea how to do a project like this. I also didn't know at the time that I was dyslexic or ADHD. Like law school was a nightmare for me, all the reading and the writing. And so I would literally drive there. I would be terrified to walk into work knowing I had this big assignment. Everybody else had little things to do. So I would sit and I would procrastinate all day, do nothing, uh -huh. like literally not even <laughs> crack open a book. I didn't even open up LexisNexis. I did nothing. And this went on for three months. I would drive there five days a week. I would do nothing all day. I'd go to lunch with the other interns. I'd then sit around, I'd do nothing all day. I didn't even have social media or the internet to like just blow off the time. I was literally doing mm -hmm. nothing. And then he called me in, you're right, I'll never forget it. I don't remember a lot of that summer, but I do remember being called in. And I remember my cheeks being bright red and my armpits were sweating like crazy. And I was wearing a suit that my mother had probably bought me at JC Penney's. And he stood there and said, how is it coming? You know, this, this speech that I need to give is coming up. I'd love to see what you're working on. And I literally blustered. I was like, oh, oh, well, yeah, there's tons of data to go through. And, and the research department's been really helpful. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm gonna get it to you. I know I'm going back to school next week. I, I promise you it'll be done. Mm -hmm. I walked out his door. <laughs> I didn't even stop by my office to turn the lights off. I went straight out to the parking lot. I jumped in my parents' car and I drove right back to Muskegon, Michigan. And I never went back, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's unbelievable that you're such a capable human being when I hear that story. Um, it is unbelievable. If I can change from somebody that is literally riddled with anxiety and, and just completely on edge all the time yeah. to a person who is, I think I'm tremendously self-aware, both the internal self-awareness mm -hmm. and external self-awareness and um, change my habits in the way that I think and really heal my nervous system, you can too. Yeah, so this happened before you were technically diagnosed and you went on to have you know, success. You were, you were in legal aid, you were a, uh, you were a public defender. Uh -huh. You become this analyst for CNN, oh, legal that analyst, later. that was later. I mean, at what point do you start story. like reckoning with all of that? Well, let's take it back, like talk, talk me through this journey, because as, <laughs> as you mentioned, you haven't been on a lot of podcasts, you haven't been on this podcast before. And I think the kind of origin story here is super important and impactful in terms of like contextualizing um, everything that you're doing now. So after law school, so I'm now on Zola, thank God, but after law, which, which helped me tremendously, it was life-saving. Uh -huh. um, it literally for me, what it did is it just turned down the volume of the negativity in my head. I mean, I understand a tremendous amount now about anxiety and panic attacks and worry. And there's a really significant connection between worry, anxiety, and panic. I believe all anxiety begins with worrying. 
that your negative thought loop mm-hmm. starts going. This is the baby. So when you start to worry about something, the thoughts start to spin, right? And as your thoughts start to spin, your body and your nervous system take notice. Anxiety is simply when worrying starts to get lodged in your body. Mm -hmm. Your body goes on edge. You guys talk about it all the time, parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous system, but it begins with a worry. Then your body gets agitated. And when your body gets agitated, I understand the science behind all this now, thankfully, and your stomach starts to feel gurgly. We make the mistake then of letting the worries pick up. Oh shit, my stomach's on edge. That must mean that something bad's gonna happen. And that only ticks up the anxiety in your body. And at some point, this gets so pronounced that your body goes, that's it, I'm getting her out of here, panic attack time. And so when you start to attack the worry loop, that's how you can slow down the anxiety. But I didn't know any of that back in the day. So I was a uh, legal aid attorney And then my husband, I did that for four years and then my husband got into business school and we moved up to Boston and the only job I could get was with a large law firm. Mm -hmm. And so I worked there for a year. I hated it, Rich. I hated it. Oh my God. I went from being in a courtroom five days a week to sitting in a suit in an office writing briefs. Like again, like this was like penance for the attorney general stunt that I pulled. And luckily I got pregnant. And when I uh, was pregnant with our first daughter, who's now 22, so this is 22 years ago, 2000, 1999. When our daughter was born, I had severe postpartum depression. And when I finally came out of it uh, and I was allowed to be with the baby, like I had to be supervised, it was that scary. Mm. And um, when I came out of it, I turned to Chris at one point and said, I, I can't go back to law, that law firm. I, I-, I do not wanna be a lawyer anymore. And for me, he said, how do you know? And I said, I don't ever wanna answer the question, what do you do with, I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And Chris, he wasn't a Buddhist then, but he was very calm, (laughs) very grounded, thank God. He looked at me and said, that's great. You realize we've just bought a house and uh, you can't be with the baby full time. She's gonna be in daycare. I've done the numbers. And you can do whatever the fuck you want, but you have to make $60,000 a year. Right. And you have four weeks to figure it out. Uh huh. Because that was when I had to go back to the law right. firm. And so I'll tell you, when you have a problem defined like that, what do you want? I'll tell you what I wanted. I wanted a job in the next four weeks that paid me $60,000 a year. If you can define what you want, you can make it happen. I networked like my life depended upon it. And I ended up the night before Rich, I was supposed to go back to that law firm. I have a habit of ghosting people. Let's just put that Uh out on the table, lace the old bell. So the (laughs) night before I was supposed to go back to, this story is so cringy. I don't write about this in the book. Wait till you hear this. The night before I'm supposed to go back, I get an offer for $55,000. Chris and I are like, okay, we'll make it work. The next day I go in to my first day back at the law firm where I've been out on paid maternity leave. to walk in the door and quit. And when I walk in, they are hosting a surprise baby shower for me. (laughs) Your head must've just lit up with all those (laughs) thoughts of, I should have ghosted them. (laughs) Yes. I should have just never gone back. Uh Oh my God. So we have the shower, you know, they have like breakfast for everybody and presents. And then I have to walk into my boss's office and tell her the news. Mm -hmm. And she was so shocked. Like, have you ever had that experience where you're talking to somebody and as you're talking, you realize they are managing their facial expression because they don't know what to do. Right. So um, that was really fun. Yeah. Um, But it kind of flipped for me because as I went around and said goodbye to people, there was one partner who stood up as I was talking and walked past me and closed the door behind me. And I thought, oh my God, what's about to happen? And he sat back down and said, I hate it here too. If that uh, startup (laughs) company is hiring, could you give them my name? (laughs) Oh my God. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna be okay. No more bait stamping. No more bait stamping. So I uh, go to this little tech startup called, at the time it was called Emode. 
And it was uh, founded by this super, super smart guy, James Courier. And I was like the fifth person in the door and I was handed a job in 1991 as the director of content. And it was my introduction to digital marketing. Mm. And I spent, uh, gosh, a year or two there. And then I went to another digital uh, kind of marketing platform uh, for creative services and uh, ended up getting fired from that job, which I should have because I did not know what I was doing. They hired me. I was able to talk myself into a great job and then clearly within Mm -hmm. four months had no clue what I was doing. And then I went to another one and uh, in a lower level and kept working. And that's when I started going, I'm not really happy. I don't really know what I wanna do. I, I've done the lawyer thing. Now I'm like in digital marketing, what the heck? The first dot com bomb happened mm-hmm. and uh, there weren't a lot of jobs. And so I hired a life coach. And the life coach that I hired was teaching a uh, course at the Sloan Business School on life design. And um, I started working with her. And the piece of the story that I left out is that in 1994, my husband and I started doing all these life improvement company uh, courses with a company called Landmark Education Mm -hmm. in New York City. And so I had like six years of Landmark courses under my belt. And I had had a ton of training in, just ontology, which is the study of being. I had had a lot of training as a coach. I had been trained to lead courses for them, but I'd never really done anything coaching wise and life coaching really wasn't a thing. And so I hired this person to help me figure out what to do with my own life. And a couple sessions in this person goes, you should be coaching people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, coaching people, what does that look like? And so it took me about six months of training. And finally I was ready to start a life coaching business. Mm. And that's what I did. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And at some point you started doing radio, right? Okay, like, that's a whole nother story. Yeah, it's like, okay. I mean, I, I but I'm, literally, seeing, I'm seeing like the little beads, you know, along the, the string that are all adding up to, you know, the Mel Robbins of today. Okay, so here's what happened. So this would have been, I, I'm, I get so lost in the timeline of my life because you know what I feel like? <laughs> I feel like, do you remember that um, Looney Tunes cartoon where is it Daffy Duck wanders into a construction site on sleeping medication? I've told this story before. No, it's, it's uh, I it? think it's Sweet Pea. Who, who the hell is The Sweet little Pea? baby in Popeye. Oh, is that what it yeah, is? Yeah, and Sweet Pea kind of crawls onto a construction site and onto an I beam, and then yes. the, the the crane lifts the I beam yes. up, and he and the baby is like crawling along the I beam, and right when the baby's going to fall to its you know imminent death, the other I beam swings around and it crawls onto the next one. That's my life, and I, I my life is exactly like that. That as well. is my life. Like as you're hearing this, like me tell the story of my career, which is somewhat embarrassing. It is a it's a, te- a testament to resilience, though. I literally fail over and over and over again. I lose my way a million times before I find myself. And even when I find myself, I eventually feel lost again and go looking for myself again, constantly seeking, constantly growing, constantly failing. And so I start this life coaching business. I love it. It goes incredibly, incredibly well. Um, This would have been like, 2002 to like 2000, I don't know, I'm guessing here, six maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, what ends up happening is a friend of mine emails me, forwards an email to me. And when you look at the chain of the form, form, when you look at the chain of the forward, what you see at the bottom is there's somebody at Inc. Magazine looking to write an article about life coaches. And I immediately scan the thing and it's a month old. The deadline is passed. I have none of the credentials they're looking for. I have none of the types of clients they're looking for. And I start to go like we always do down the list of reasons why I should not respond. Like we're always arguing against ourselves, Mm -hmm. always holding ourselves back. And I immediately say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, What would somebody who's more successful than me do? And I'm like, they'd fucking apply. Right. So I take a sip of wine. I start typing like crazy and I just free form this hilarious response back a month late with none of the credentials, da, 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 da. She writes back the next day and says, I was about to turn the article in. What if I come to Boston next week and ta- trail you? Wow. So she comes, she follows me around for a day. She ends up publishing an article 
And I'm like, oh yes, because, oh, that's right. Because the article uh, released in 2005, I can't believe how old I am, 2005, my God, that's like 16 years ago. I know, but it seems like yesterday. And I'm pregnant with our son and our third child. And I'm like, this is gonna be amazing. The timing of this article is fabulous. This article is gonna print rich and I am gonna have an avalanche of clients. It's gonna be awesome. The article prints fucking crickets, not a single client, not a single inbound email, nada, nothing, nothing. So uh, I forget about it. I'm out to dinner one night, my phone's ringing. It's a New York number. Like who the heck is calling me from New York? I pick up the phone and is this Mel Robbins? Yeah, this is Mel Robbins. Hey, this is Mary Duffy from CNBC. I'm Mm. like, oh, hi, Mary Duffy, how are you? Having no idea who she is. She's like, well, I saw the article in Inc. Magazine and we'd like to fly you down and talk to you. So literally a week later, I find myself on a plane down to New York, drive over to New Jersey, walk into the offices. I sit down and I am in a meeting with the executives at CNBC and they're in a development meeting. Oh my God, coaching is hot. We think you're amazing. We want to do a show. We want to stick it between Kramer and Donnie Deutsch was on at the time, the big idea. And we'd like you to do da, 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 da. I walk out of there with a freaking development deal. Oh my God. To do, that really is like a sweet pea thing. Yes, to do a talk show, not to do like a call-in advice show for the money audience on mon, mon, non-money topics in between Kramer and Donnie Deutsch. Wow. So they decided that, by the way, that never happened. Okay, not the story, but the show. Mm-hmm. So in the meantime, they are like, we should put you on Donnie's show all the time to start to seed you to our audience. So I'm now being uh, brought down to New York once a week to appear on the big idea, Donnie Deutsch's show as like a panelist. And I am just kind of doing my thing. Meanwhile, something else is happening. There is a show that is being cast by Fox uh, called, it was a business makeover show where they were going to do something like the Gordon Ramsay show with kitchens, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to do that with small businesses. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, this show has been played out now a million times, but I'm talking 2007 here and 2008. This is the time zone that this was happening in. And so I'm now starting to feel like, holy cow, like my freaking gravy train is coming in. I'm not only like in development at CNBC, which means jack shit, by the way. Right. I am now, oh, I don't even know about this yet. So so I am, um, so the show's in development and the executives at Fox are talking to Donnie Deutsch about hosting the show. Mm-hmm. I know nothing about it, Rich. I'm just happily life coaching and I am happily appearing on the big idea thinking I am a big shit, which I am not. All of a sudden my agent calls me and says, because I didn't even have an agent, I had to get one because I didn't know how to negotiate the contract because I was Mm -hmm. a criminal lawyer, blah, 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 blah. This guy that represented me called me and said, you're never gonna believe this. I said, what? He said, there is a guy who runs all of non-scripted, meaning reality programming at Fox. It's responsible for American Idol, the whole deal. And they wanna talk to you about hosting a reality show for Fox. That's a business makeover show. I'm like, you're kidding me. And he said, no, they want you on a plane tonight out of Austin. I'm like, you're kidding me. So um, I pack up, I go to the, oh, this is a hilarious story, you ready? Brace yourself. So I pack up, I go to Logan, it's 2007. I'm terrified of flying. I'm wearing sneakers, a uh, sweats pants, a sweatshirt, I have a roll-on suitcase that has the single best suit I own and a pair of high heels in it because you have to dress the part. Like interviewing is all about walking Mm -hmm. in as the person. I have my makeup in there, I'm ready to go. The meeting is at 8.30 in the morning in LA. I get on this plane and I am sitting in my seat, breathing through my breathing exercises because I uh, had not invented the five second rule yet as I'm having a panic attack and all of a sudden it dawns on me, I've left my suitcase at the Starbucks in the airport. Oh no. (laughs) I have the interview of my life tomorrow morning. Right, by the time you land in LA, you can't go to the store. It's midnight. Yeah. 
you're toast. Yeah. So I get up early. I go to the front desk of the hotel they've put me in, the nicest hotel I've ever been in. I feel already like the world's biggest fraud. I don't belong here. I am in pit stained t-shirt and dirty sweats. My hair is greasy as hell because I have literally been sweating all night thinking about what I'm gonna do. And I said, is there anything open? Do you have anything in Lost and Found that I can borrow? I don't even mm. wanna steal it. I just need to wear it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. He's like, oh, actually there is a target that is on your way to the place that you're going to go that opens at eight. So the car service picks me up. I tell him to beeline it to Target. I ran through that Target like I was in one of those shopping spree game shows. <laughs> black pants, black shirt, black eye heels, dry shampoo, running, running, running. Uh, you know, like a little like thing, like the foundation thing, running, 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 run out. I change in the back seat of the car. You know, all this, I snap across the heels because the heels are connected, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I get out of the car. And I realize I have grabbed a size or 10 heels and I wear a size eight. So I'm now in like three <laughs> inch high flip flops that are going <laughs> as I'm walking. And I shuffle my way down the thing and I walk into the meeting and I land the roll. Mm. And this should have been the last time I ever did television because I have been screwed all three times I did TV, except for CNN. So what happened? Did that show never... Thankfully Transpire? it never aired because yeah. this is what happened. Um, when I landed the role, the role was to basically do extreme office makeover. You take a struggling business and you get to have the extraordinary job of making over the whole thing. Everything from training employees to the whole physical space itself. Remember the extreme home makeover and they'd like, yeah. you know, kind of move the bus. And so that was the show concept. Four months later, when we were ready to tape the show, they had uh, brought on some big names in reality, End Em All, 51 Minds, and the show had completely changed. Mm. And it was now a show called Someone's Gotta Go. And I was told that I would be firing people mm. from real jobs on national TV on a reality show. Wow. Yeah. And I- um, Welcome to Hollywood. Well, it's not what I signed up for and I love helping people. And so I remember calling my husband sobbing from the hotel room and calling my agent sobbing. I can't do this, I'm quitting. And he's like, I don't think you understand what you've gotten yourself into. There's a crew of 150 people. There's Fox and two massive production companies. They have already cast the entire season, Mel. And it's an unbelievable opportunity. I mean, essentially, you if were you like that back kind in, of thing, back in Boston, coaching however many people, and nobody calling you after that but I was article happy. came out. But I was happy. Yeah, like I, I think that that's the thing is that we chase the next bigger thing. And I, look, I all these experiences are amazing, but what was immediately apparent when this train left the station is this is not a train I wanted to be on. And so we shot the first uh, two episodes and it was a, you know, I mean, the people were lovely, but it was a horrible experience. It was uh, the typical reality show. They put you in a bubble. They, they take everybody's phones. They take the television sets out of the rooms that people mm -hmm. are staying in. And again, this was 2007. This is not yeah. like when everybody's watching Love Island and we all know what the reality show thing is. And these were people that had signed up thinking they were getting a makeover. So the people who had signed up for the show, the business owners were actually told that somebody was getting fired in the opening scene because they wanted to capture the authentic reaction. Uh, that's awful. Uh-huh. And if you're a person that for me, it was never about doing this for show. I thought that I was on a show that was gonna help businesses. And look, I realized that right. a lot of times you gotta fire people to help your business. Mm -hmm. But that's not at all what I wanted to do. And we were teetering on a recession. And at the same time, my husband's restaurant business was starting to face some real challenges as restaurant businesses often do. And so the thought of actually going in and pushing a small business owner over the edge on national television was gut-wrenching. We shot two episodes. Um, I don't know how I made it through it. And then luckily, again, the I-beam comes over and as I'm falling, I'm caught. 
Uh, the legal department at Fox said the recession is coming on. This is the wrong show at the wrong time. And this is tabled. Mm. And so instead of airing it on January 6th on my husband's 40th birthday with American Idol as the lead in. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Holy shit. <sighs> um, I dodged that. But then got handed. Life would have been very different if that show aired for you, I think. I think my career would have been over. You think? I do. Well, I, you know, look, I mean, everybody can well, the remake timing themselves saved you. over and over and over right. again. But you would have been vilified. Vilified. And I didn't believe and in what I was doing. You would have to kind of wear the mantle of, you know, the evil person who, who, you know, delivers the hatchet. Yeah. Like I wasn't, if you're not vested in it, you can't defend it. And, you know, if I believe in what I'm doing, I will fight anybody to mm -hmm. the death over it. Mm -hmm. But I didn't believe in what I was doing. That's why it was the kiss of death. I didn't realize you had all these television experiences prior. So I'm not even done. Yeah. So um, what happens next is um, I go, oh, thank God. And then the agent lawyer person calls me and says, well, I have some bad news. And I said, what's that? And they said, um, the executives at Fox want this to air and you're locked under contract. So you can't do anything for the next year. And I thought I was all smart because I negotiated a deal where I had more of a back end, and I only got paid as the episodes aired. Mm. So I found myself unemployed mm. and I felt like such a idiot that I didn't even have the confidence to go back to coaching people. And it was at this point that my husband's second and third restaurant started to fail. The liens hit the house and I was 41 years old, a former lawyer turned digital marketing failure who became a happy and successful life coach who then got too big for her britches and stepped into television, got handed one kind of experience after another and now I'm 41 years old and I have no idea what to do with my life or what I should do. And I feel like a complete failure. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my husband's restaurants, which we've secured with our house and our life savings and our kids' college funds are going under. We're $800,000 in debt. I'm unemployed. And it was certainly at that moment, the worst moment in my life. Oh, we're coming back for more, don't you worry. But first, let me get a word in about my favorite shades and specs on this particular planet, which are made by the good people at Roca. For basically my entire active life, I've dealt with a choice when it comes to working out. Either make peace with my glasses falling off my face, slipping down my nose, or getting after it half blind. So of course, neither choice is a good one, especially cycling without proper prescription lenses. That's not a good idea. Then here comes Roka with this massive selection of crazy light, but also super stylish line of eyeglasses and sunglasses for every type of activity from cubicle life to adventure racing that just stick to my mug no matter what. And it's like all my prayers have been answered. The optics are top notch, no glare, and they have these bendable temples and different sized nose pads. So you can customize your fit to your beautiful original face. Nobody else does this people. And right now Roka's try on program makes it super easy to find your perfect pair. They'll send you glasses at home so you can try them and see what looks good. And then you just send them your prescription, place your order and boom, you're all set. The best part is you guys only you guys get 20% off with the code RICHROLL. One word, no space. So go to roca.com, that's R-O-K-A.com and check them out. And don't forget to enter code RICHROLL for 20% off. And finally, we're brought to you by my saving grace when it comes to releasing muscle tension and promoting recovery. You know it, you love it, Theragun. Point blank, I'm obsessed with my Theragun, which for those that don't already know, is basically this very sturdy, handsome, handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combination of depth, speed, and power. 
out of all the devices out there, this one I'm telling you is primo. The Theragun Gen 4 is quiet, it comes with an OLED screen and an app that learns from your behaviors and actually suggests guided routines and it's super cool looking, not for nothing. Whether you wanna treat your muscle tension from working out, you wanna deal with an injury or just manage the stresses of everyday life, the Gen 4 Theragun releases tension using Theragun's signature percussive therapy, which goes 60% deeper than vibration alone. Personally, using my Theragun has become an integral part of my day. As some of you guys know, I'm dealing with some back issues and Theragun has just been crucial in helping me stay active and feeling good. It really is a game changer. So try it out. Give Theragun a go for 30 days, starting at only $199. Go to therabody.com slash richroll right now and get your Gen 4 Theragun today. That's Therabody dot com slash rich roll therabody dot com slash rich roll. Okay, back to the show. So this is like 2008. Yeah, yeah. lousy year for a lot of people. Yeah. Housing crisis. Not a good year for us either. Yeah, it was brutal. Um, and that's a phase that was pretty protracted, right? You guys really went through it. And the more I learn about you know, what went down for you, it's kind of amazing to me. I mean, we can talk about all the entrepreneurial success, et cetera, but more importantly, that your marriage survived this because you guys were at loggerheads. Oh, big yeah, time. Big time, because um, it's a lot easier to be angry than to be afraid. And so when the shit hit the fan in my life, even though I had made a ridiculous number of mistakes, many of which I've been talking about with you. Uh, I uh, reacted to this crisis in my life and my marriage and in our finances, like a lot of high functioning adults by screaming at my husband and drinking myself into the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like any respectful person would do. <laughs> Why? Right. I, um, I, it was a low moment. Look, I think that mm -hmm. you know when you hit rock bottom you'll know when you hit rock bottom because you finally hit something solid within yourself. And what happened for me is I spent eight, six months screaming at Chris and drinking like crazy. And you know, this is a terrible period in our lives. Our kids even remember it. This is the part yeah. that sucks. They remember coming downstairs in the morning and I'm still asleep in the chair in the living room. They remember uh, Chris being angry all the time. They remember sort of the standoff like it's one thing to be roommates with your partner. It's another thing to be in a standoff, which mm -hmm. Chris and I were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wasn't Chris's fault. This is the restaurant business. I mean, this is the risk of entrepreneurship. It's not like he went into business and was like, let's just fuck this up and go a million dollars. That's not at all what happened. Yeah. You know, I you you pick locations and some are great and some suck. And if you do that at the second location, you're gonna be in trouble with your business model. And what happened for Chris, and we're still unpacking this to this day, is that he, as the business started to fail, started to marry that with his own identity right. and think yeah. that he was a failure. You talk about that in the new book yeah. and his, his self-identification with that failure being very personal, whereas his investors didn't see it that way. They realized this is a calculated risk. Yep. And you in turn, you know, seeing Chris through the lens of that failure, such that no matter what he did, whether he's mowing the lawn or taking the kids to the park or, you know, coaching a, a sports team was all indications of that failure as opposed to contributing to the right. family welfare. Right. I mean, it, it, it took a, a number of years. I mean, basically what ended up happening is, um, you know, as, as the liens were hitting the house and the bankruptcy letters were arriving and, Chris was scrambling with his business partner to pull the business out of the wreckage, which by the way, they ultimately did mm -hmm. um, and ended up selling off the, the units, not for great success, but they certainly did not provide the return on the investment that they had hoped, but they mitigated a tremendous amount of loss and risk. Yeah. And the thing that I think a lot about is that you know, Chris's business partner has a way more optimistic, what I call high five attitude. And he was able to separate his identity from what had happened in the business. And for whatever reason, Chris just couldn't. Mm. 
And so he left the business in 2014 and just really, really, it's been a long process for him to separate who he is from what happened in that business. Mm -hmm. So here you are, it's 2008, you're 800. I feel 800, like I'm having a hot flash. 800 grand. Oh my God. <laughs> Don't ghost me. Go are you gonna get up and just leave, leave just oh walk God. out on me? <laughs> I'm getting hot. Somebody bring me a Come fan. on. Okay, okay, here we go. It's all the lights. 800 grand in debt. Yes. Now in retrospect, being this uh, you know, person who embodies self-empowerment, it's very easy and, and almost cavalier to say, things like this happen for a reason. They're happening for you, not to you. Julie would call it your divine moment, right? But when you're in that, it's like, you don't, you can't hear that. You don't wanna hear that. You're like, fuck off. You don't understand my pain. Of I need course. a solution now. Yes, I agree. Look, when you like, here's the thing about mindset. A mindset will not change the shitty situation you're in. A positive mindset changes you, mm -hmm. which changes your ability to deal with the shitty situation that you're in. Well, this goes to so many of the things that you talk about and, and a subject matter that I love and the neuroscience proves this out, this idea of developing a bias towards action. You know, in, in AA, we call it mood follows action. The idea being that we're all victims of some level of analysis paralysis and we're waiting until we feel like doing something or we are you know, blessed with the spark of inspiration. But in truth, the only way to shift out of any of these kinds of scenarios is to take an action first, right? As hard as that is. And the, the emotions, the perceptions, all of that follows action, not the other way around. 100% true. So how I discovered this in my life is during this horrible period in life. So 2008, every morning I would wake up and I would immediately start spinning the negative thoughts. We're fucked. I hate my husband. How did we end up here? I can't believe I did that stupid ass show. I've made so many mistakes. I should just flush my life, you know, the, the last mm -hmm. 40 years down the toilet. You know, I'm so embarrassed. I'm the world's worst mother. I'd stare at the ceiling. I was like a human pot roast marinating in fear. And then of course, the anxiety would wave up my body and pin me down to that bed and I'd hit the snooze button. Mm -hmm. And I would hit the snooze button four or five times a morning. By the time I woke up, the kids had missed the bus. So we got three kids under the age of 10. Chris was long gone because he's a very smart man and he did not want to be in the house when I was awake. And he was trying to fix the situation that they were in. And... I would literally scream at the kids, get them in the car. And from there, the day was just horrible. And then every night I would do the same thing. I'd say, that's it. Tomorrow morning, it's gotta be the new me. Everybody that struggles with addiction does this exact same thing. Tomorrow, I'm not drinking. That's it. I, that, I'm done mm -hmm. with this. And then the next morning, it's the same fucking pattern of negative crap that you're doing to yourself. And this is exactly what you talk about all the time. It's not the what you need to do, it's how. How do you make yourself do the things that feel hard or scary or don't seem like they're gonna work because you're resigned and you're stuck in your patterns? That was me. I knew I needed to get out of bed. I knew I needed to stop drinking. I knew I needed to look for a job. I knew this wasn't Chris's fault and I needed to stop screaming at him all the time, but I wasn't doing any of those things. I didn't know how. And so this was the moment I created the five second rule. And again, this is another I-beam or T-beam or mm -hmm. whatever the hell beam it's called. I'm sitting in front of the television and I am watching TV. The kids are in bed and I'm drinking uh, bourbon and I'm probably on like my fourth Manhattan and I'm having my nightly pep talk and I'm going, that's it. Tomorrow morning, it's the new me. I, I gotta wake up. I gotta do this. I gotta do the other thing. And all of a sudden, Rich, honest to goodness, I see a rocket ship launch at the end of a commercial. And I go, that's it. Tomorrow morning, I'm launching myself out of bed like a rocket. And that was the beginning of the five second rule. Mm -hmm. What's so interesting about that are these, you talk about like hitting your bottom and this is, a, this, is, this is a bottom for sure. But in that kind of reckoning where the pain of your current circumstance exceeds the fear of doing something different, no matter how small that difference is, um, there's like a, like a crack in the universe, mm. like a little opening, right? Where you have, just the slightest bit of willingness that you didn't have the day before. And even the tiniest action, whether it's picking up the phone to make a call or counting back down from five, when you look back now, it's like, 
I did a couple little things that changed my life forever. This incident, you know, obviously changed your life forever. And it's kind of amazing in a beautiful mystical way how that occurs. I think it occurs when you're ready. Wasn't yours a phone call? Yeah, I had a couple in my life. I mean, when I, you know, when I got sober, I hit a certain bottom and that was, you know, that was a phone call to say, I'm ready, like, let's go to rehab. Um, I had it again at 40 on a, on, on a staircase, realizing I needed rehab for life or lifestyle. <laughs> um, but I look at those events as great blessings yeah. and things to be really revered. And when I talk about it, I'm always quick to remind people that I think we're all blessed with those moments in various shapes and forms, but we do have to be ready. And we also have to be aware because when they're visited upon us, if we're not paying attention, they can quickly pass like sliding doors, right? And I often think how many other incidents like this have I allowed to slip by where if I had been more aware and present and perhaps in a position to be ready to receive them, my life could have changed in, in other ways that you know, in some parallel universe, I'd be living a different life. Well, let me tell you my intention for this conversation that you listening to us have this podcast be that crack that lets some light in and becomes a sliding door that you might just see, oh, wow, maybe if that phone call I'm avoiding mm-hmm. or counting backwards five, four, three, two, one, or high-fiving myself in the mirror, even though I don't think I deserve it. And I think it's stupid and I'm a failure. And why is this gonna help that you try it? Yeah. Because I think that any, you can trace back again, back to our dots analogy, any change in trajectory was just a moment. And for me, that moment was when the alarm went off, I just counted backwards like NASA launches a rocket, five, four, three, two, one, and I stood up. And you know what my first reaction to it was? This is fucking stupid. Correct. Yeah. Resignation. <laughs> yeah. It was immediately like, okay, so you can get out of bed. So fucking what? You're $800,000 in debt, Mel. How is this gonna help? And. Thankfully, I thought, well, what the hell do I have to lose? Why not just for one day, anytime, Mel, you know what you should do, but you don't feel like it. Or anytime your emotions start to hijack you or anytime you feel afraid or anxious or whatever, why don't you just count backwards and see what happens? Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. Yeah. And I haven't looked back. I think the power of it, because it is like on some level, it it really is fucking stupid. Oh, totally. And when I first (laughs) saw you on... Facebook or whatever before I knew you. And I was like, who is this? What is this? You come, can say the word, fucking, I don't care. I can take it, break. break. I was like, the, the five, come on. You know, this is a bunch of bullshit, right? Now I've gotten to know you. I adore you. I love you. I think you're brilliant and, and talented in so many ways. Um, but it took me a minute to get my head around this thing. But I think where I'm at now with it is that there's a certain genius in the simplicity and the low hanging fruit nature of it. Like I had to pick up a phone, pick up a phone and make a very difficult phone call. That phone weighs a thousand pounds. That's a, that's a heavy, that's a, that's a leap, right? But to say, well, I can count down from five to one, right? I could, I could do that at least like it's creating permission and a welcome mat and something that's so accessible for anybody, no matter how much pain they're in or whatever circumstances they might find themselves in. So whether it's counting down from five to one or giving yourself a high five in the mirror, it may seem like childish or silly, but in truth, there's a, there's a neurochemical thing that takes place that sets in motion a chain of events that allow you to take that initial action and that then puts you in a position to take further actions. And that's where the cascading effect happens and lives change. Well, you said it earlier. So let me hit you with the science because the fact is I used it in secret for three years to five, four, three, two, one, pick up that phone that weighed a thousand pounds. And part of the genius of this is that when you start counting backwards, you've already committed to taking action. So the counting itself moves you from a bias towards thinking toward a bias toward action. And the more you repeat it, the more you break the pattern of thinking and you program in a pattern of taking small actions. It creates agile moves, an agile mindset. So that's one thing. 
The second thing that's crazy cool about this is that the reason why it's so fucking hard to change is because you talk about changing with the prefrontal cortex. You're mm -hmm. conscious when you sit in your therapist chair or you're listening to me and Rich and you're using the think, you're using this sort of strategic part of your brain. The second that you're in a situation where you're procrastinating or you're thinking negative thoughts, it's your subconscious that's in charge of you. And so in order to change, you have to interrupt subconscious patterns. You see, the five second rule isn't just some dumb counting backwards thing. It is a form of metacognition that interrupts the pattern stored in your subconscious brain. Counting backwards requires you to focus, which flips on your prefrontal cortex. It gives you a moment of control over what you think and do next. That's the genius of it. And the th reason why I'm so fucking passionate about this is not only because kids can use it and senior citizens can use it. You don't have to have any kind of education or speak any kind of language. It works for anybody that uses it is because I am now standing with millions of people that have tried it. And uh, the we have pediatricians around the world that are using it to help kids interrupt thoughts that trigger anxiety, veterans organizations that are using 54321 to help reprogram responses to triggers. We had an entire wing of a Pennsylvania psychiatric inpatient nursing unit show up at the talk show to tell me that of all of the tools that they give people that have an inpatient commit, the single most positive and effective tool is the five second rule mm. because it is simple, you remember it, and it immediately interrupts the negative and suicidal ideations that torture people. And speaking of suicide, we know of 111 people who have stopped themselves from taking their lives by 54321 asking for help. Mm. So I am here to tell you, I don't give a fuck how stupid you think this is. I want you to try it. I want you to share it with people because interrupting the patterns of thought and behavior that are holding you back and pushing yourself to take action or to think something different, it is the only way you are gonna change. And this is a tool that's gonna help you bridge that gap. Boom. I know. <laughs> we just found the clip. We could pull that clip. Whatever you throw want. Throw it up. Who would have thought? I didn't when intend to do any on, of this. You're on the I-beam crawling from one thing to the next. Still. Well, what's so funny is that you end up doing this TEDx talk, right? And but you know, was that was a whole thing too. Like I didn't apply. How did that happen? Oh, well, you, you're gonna die when you hear this. You ready? So I, I, TEDx wasn't even a thing. This was like one of the first TEDx conferences. Mm -hmm. So it's TEDx San Francisco. Hello, San Francisco, TEDx. And a friend of a friend of a friend is the person curating it. And they're looking for somebody that can talk about career change. Hello, Mel Robbins. Hi, everybody, how are you? The chameleon of careers. Right, 50 careers. Yeah, 50 careers. And she's a talker. Now, I had never given a formal speech on a stage. You know, people think just because you're a lawyer, somehow you're a public speaker. Not true. In fact, there are a lot of people that practice law that are introverted. I don't happen to be one of them, but um, I'd never given a speech. And so I uh, get this email from this person asking if I'd be interested in giving a talk about career change for this thing called TEDx. They were offering uh, two tickets to San Francisco uh, and they were also gonna put us up in the St. Regis, a hotel that was uh -huh. the nicest hotel I've yeah. ever stayed in. <laughs> At this point, we still have $800,000 right. liens on our house and kids under the age uh -huh. of 14 and we're like, yes, a free vacation. Mm -hmm. So despite my fears of giving a speech, we go. There was very little training and um, I got on that stage and I literally had like a 21 minute long panic attack. Mm -hmm. If you look closely, you will see the chest rash start to appear at about minute one. I'm darting all over the stage like a freak. Oh my God, blinding light. At one point I jump off it. That was not like planned. I just was think, trying to escape. <laughs> and um, at the very end, Rich, I forgot how to end it. I wasn't supposed to talk about the five second rule because at that point, I still thought it was so dumb. Like, how am I gonna possibly explain? I didn't know any of the science. I'd been using it for three years. I knew it worked. Mm -hmm. And I look out there, I forget how I'm supposed to end this thing. And I go, oh, 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 wait, okay, this is the last part, sorry. So one more thing that you can use. I call it the five second rule. I call it the five second rule. The moment you've got an instinct to act, you gotta move within five seconds or else your brain will kill it. Thank you very much. 
I think I was so disassociated at that point. I even gave out my email address. So I leave. Did they edit it out? Because there's like 20... Eight million views of this thing at this point. I know. So a year goes by. I literally leave. The first thing I said to Chris backstage is, "I'm never giving a speech again." That is the worst experience of my life. He's like, "That was. It wasn't that bad. Don't worry. Like, there's, <laughs> you know, like th- there are only 500 people out there." Uh-huh. A year goes by, Rich. A year, and then somebody puts it all online. I don't even know it's online. Another year goes by, and now it's got like a million views. And it's at this point, I'm starting, I get my first email like, hey, I saw that thing you did for TEDx. I'm like, were you there? And they're like, no, it's online. I'm like, it's online? I had no idea. Mm. So for a year, people asked me to come speak at their events. I didn't know normal people got paid. I thought you had to be a best-selling author like Rich Roll. I thought you had to have a podcast like Rich Roll. I thought you had to like be somebody like Rich Roll. I did not know that normal human beings, especially those of us that fall off I-beams or A-beams or whatever they're called as part of our success strategy, got paid to do this. So I just happily speak for free at seven different events that year. So now we're probably talking, what, 2013? Mm-hmm. And somebody comes up to me and says, another I, is it an A-beam or an I-beam? I-beam, I I-beam. think. Okay, yeah. so another I-beam moment. She walks up to me and goes, oh my gosh, can I ask you a question? I was a speaker at the event too. You were so great. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And she said, did you get your check yet? And I said, check? You got paid for that? And she looked at me with horror and goes, you didn't? I just assumed you did. Mm. And I thought, I am a complete moron. Like I... Didn't even occur to me to ask to get paid. And so I um, made myself this promise. This is genius. If you have no idea how to break into an industry, this is how you price yourself. I said, the next time somebody calls, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna count backwards five, four, three, two, one. And you're gonna say, yes, I'm available. What's your budget? And then you're gonna count backwards five, four, three, two, one. Because it's really effective at putting yourself in pause Mm -hmm. and say, normally I'm double. I love that. I love the what's your budget because you always want them to put the number out first Mm -hmm. and then you know what you're dealing with. And see, at this point in my career, I was so just grateful and desperate. That's a terrible combination to be grateful and desperate. Um, So grateful that anybody would hire me and so desperate for the money because dude, we still had liens on our house. Yeah. We were barely making the ends meet. In 2014, Chris was just leaving the restaurant business. He hadn't been paid in six months. So how do you go from having a panic attack on the TED stage, TEDx stage to being this, you know, crazy in-demand speaker? I mean, first on a, a, you know, a pure kind of like trajectory, but also on a skill level, like how did you learn how to do it? Because for people that haven't seen Mel do her thing, I mean, you're masterful at this. I mean, nobody can command a stage the way that you do. And, you know, I was watching some of your stuff online earlier today having my own panic attack because I got to get on a plane tomorrow and go give two speeches out of town. And I haven't done this in like two and a half years. And I think even on my best days, I'm like a B minus at this and I really want to get good. And I've been trying to figure it out myself. And I realize there's so much to learn and so many things I don't know about how to do this. Well, I feel like I'm capable of it, but um, I've lacked like the guidance from other people that kind of helped me figure it out. This is something I'm a genius at. Mm. And I had to get through tremendous fear to discover that I'm a genius at it. And so I want you listening to us to know that there is something that you are meant to be doing. And it is your fear and your negative story and sort of the pain of going from being out of shape at something to getting into shape in something that is keeping you from tapping deep within you into that thing that you're meant to do. And what I'm meant to do is not be on stages. I'm meant to move people. And what I mean by that is everything that I do has the intention to either move you into action or move your state of thinking or your state of emotion or emotional state. And so what happened for me is, first of all, I was talking about something that I deeply believe in because as that TEDx talk started to gain momentum, people started to write to me from around the world. I was literally spending three or four hours a night rich 
writing emails back. Okay, mm. well, you can use it for procrastination like this. And then I started getting tons of questions about, about anxiety. So I would start picking up the phone or emailing experts to understand how to answer these questions. And I finally was, I, I became so masterful about the topic and so passionate about it, not because of my experience, but because this stupid thing was working for people around the world. And now I had some of the leading experts in neuroscience and habit research and anxiety and pediatric uh, medicine and oncology validating why it worked. Mm. And so now I'm like, oh, I need to tell people about this. And it was because of the impact it was making in other real people's lives that emboldened me that I gotta get my ass on that stage and I gotta figure out, because here's the problem, right? I have the world's stupidest topic to talk about. Dumb. I am literally gonna get in a stadium in front of 25,000 people and for an hour. And tell them to count back from five. And say, <laughs> you can change your life in five <laughs> seconds. Who the fuck is gonna do that? <laughs> I better show up and be so entertaining and so moving and so convincing and so just irrefutable that you not only believe me, you're fucking bawling at the end of that speech because you realize, holy fuck, I have missed so many five second moments. I have given up on myself. I have doubted myself. I fucking hold myself back. I can't do this to myself anymore because it is true, Rich. Your whole life comes down to these five second windows, these moments of hesitation, these moments of opportunities where you either step forward, lean in, speak up, or you fucking lean back and you hold yourself back. Your marriage, your finances, your expertise, your business, it all comes down to how and who and what you do in this five second window. And I am here to tell you, if you learn how to manage your response, what you think and what you do within this five second window, you can do or be anything. But most of us stop and hesitate and then the habit of doubting ourselves mm -hmm. takes over. The habit of saying, I don't deserve that. The habit of you pulling away from what you want. That is why I'm so passionate. And so in terms of how to be masterful at public speaking, start with the audience. It's always, what do you want it's them to about feel? Them. What do you want them to feel when you're done talking? Empowered. Yeah. Inspired. Yeah. I want them to feel a sense of agency over their lives. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel like there's a path mm -hmm. that, that is ready to unfold for them. And mm -hmm. I wanna give them tools to begin that process. I would pick one tool. Mm. And See, I this is the thing that you're so good at. I mean, for all of the things that you talk about, I think underappreciated or under discussed is this incredible skill that you have to communicate complex ideas clearly by distilling them down into very kind of um, simplistic's the wrong word, but like elemental. I like simplistics. Things. Dude, I'm not a celebrity person at all. I'm not a mass media person at all. I like the average person. The average person has a ton of shit going on and a lot that they're shouldering. It's why I wanted to do daytime talk because the person that's still watching daytime talk has very few resources and has been left be behind by most media. But I love real people. And you can only reach real people when you're having real conversations and you're discussing real problems. And simplistic solutions are what work for complicated problems. Mm -hmm. Life's complicated enough, my God. Mm. If you can remember the tool, you'll fucking use it. Mm -hmm. Which brings us to the high five. <laughs> oh, this is even dumber than the Counting, five second like, roll. <laughs> staying on the theme of fives, right? Yes, yes. How can I extend this thing? Well, we should point out. So you end up writing this book, the five second roll that like blows up. And oh, that's an like, IB moment though. I, I, the yeah. book launch failed, dude. No, it didn't. Yes, it did. You, yeah, the story of the five second roll book, you guys. So I self-published that book, okay? Right. 
because I just thought, okay, I, I wanna own what I do because I'm a control freak. I wanna own what I do and I really care about this message and nobody's gonna tell this the way that I wanna tell it. So I self-publish the book. I study all the best-selling authors to figure out how do you get on the lists because if you get on the list, then you know mass media will pay attention and mm -hmm. more people will get the book, whatever. No one told you that if you self-publish, the lists are out the window? No. So I literally self-published the book, not knowing you will not make a single list and not realizing there won't be a single bookstore that carry the book. So I put all my effort into marketing for this big book launch. We're gonna sell as many books as possible so I can get on the list. And um, here's what happens. I um, do everything you're supposed to do. I have a puny ass newsletter list at that point, like 8,000 people or whatever. I uh, am on like one podcast, I'm doing a couple speeches. And on the day the book goes on sale, I pour all the energy at getting people to buy on Amazon. Within two hours, everybody's writing saying it's out of stock. And I'm thinking there's no way 20,000 books are out of stock. No way. Mm. I, I, like, I don't have that many people on the newsletter list. And my Aunt Sally only bought four of them. So like, you know, there's no way there's 20,000. And this is what I know now. If Amazon has a product that is unknown and they get an unexpected surge that's pretty consistent, they turn off inventory. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Because they just assume it's fraud. Correct. And they also wanna make sure they can check with inventory to make sure the supply is okay before they say it's being shipped. Mm. So for that's the first deadly. two weeks of my book launch, as I am now exhausting everything that I've worked for six months to try to do, all the traffic that I'm sending to Amazon is going to a page that says out of stock. I am literally crying every day. Meanwhile, Tony Robbins has launched a book the same day. So every fucking where I go, his face is everywhere. He's in the front of every bookstore. He's in every airport. I'm like, dear universe, why? I get asked every time I speak, are you Tony Robbins' wife? Because right. my last name is Robbins. I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> Christopher Robbins. Robbins' wife, which is actually my husband's name, Christopher Robbins. I literally thought, what have I done? Why me? Why am I the bad news bearers? Why do I always have to sneak in the back door? Why does nothing ever work out for me? Why do all these other people get to have it easy? Why are they all friends? Why do they support? Like, why, 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 why? So I am literally licking my wounds thinking that this is the worst thing that's ever happened. Meanwhile, I have completely forgotten that I also self-published the audiobook. When people went, I didn't know this was happening, mm -hmm. but about four weeks later, when I have just chalked up the book as a total failure, I get an email from Audible that says, your monthly report is due. And I literally fall out of my chair. It was six figures. Wow. I So it just directed everybody to get the audio book. And this was at an inflection point for audio books. Audio books hadn't quite tipped over into being as mainstream as they are now, but that was a 2017. Huge, yeah, that was like right around the time where it started to become a thing. And Audible is owned by Amazon. So everything that right. happens on Audible impacts the Amazon algorithm. So all of a sudden, the five second rule shot up. It was the number one audiobook of the year in 2017. It was the number six most read book of the year on Amazon. It has been translated into 36 languages in four years flat. It has sold millions of copies. And here's the most important thing I want you to hear. It has never made a bestsellers list. Right, it's and, so crazy how and, that But works. Here's, here's the thing I want, every, I want you to understand. Your dreams have a purpose. I have always dreamt of being a New York Times bestselling author. Never have been. That dream has a purpose. And the purpose of that dream is to pull me through my bullshit and my fears and my anxiety and my sense of unworthiness to make me work for something. But those dreams are not necessarily to be fulfilled. They are a vehicle that gets you moving. Hmm. There is something so much better in store for you than that dream. There's something bigger. Because what happened to me is by not making that dream, I've learned an entirely new business model. I mean, I have a huge partnership with Audible now. Right, you've done a ton of stuff with Audible. You're one of their leading partners in the uh -huh. whole sort of listening space all together. Yep. yep, I never would have known that. Had, my, had I achieved my dream of being a New York Times bestselling author, if I had had a successful traditional book launch, I never would be where I am right now. Yeah, there's no way. No it way. It would have satisfied your ego temporarily. Correct. For the two weeks or whatever that it was on the list. And then 
after that, all the all the re- first of all, you wouldn't have sold that many audiobooks because the book would have been available. Yep. And you definitely would not have made the cake that would have all gone to the publisher. Yeah. Which is insane because I'm sure you just printed money off of the audiobook. Yeah. So self publishing looking pretty good now. Oh, extraordinarily yeah, great. Unbelievable. But so here's the other thing that that taught me. It's what gave me that sort of high five attitude, this mantra. And the mantra, because I, as I was schlepping through airports and the book is out of stock and Tony Robbins face is everywhere. And I'm thinking I'm the world's biggest failure. I kept saying this to myself on repeat. There is no way Mel, if you've worked this hard that you will not be rewarded. You have to believe that this moment is preparing you for something amazing that hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. Keep going. You have to believe that this moment is preparing you for something amazing that hasn't happened yet. Keep going. And so I repeated that over and over and over and over and over again, as I wanted to throw in the towel, as I would start to bash myself, as I would start to feel sorry for myself and be like, nope, there's just no way I'm gonna believe that something amazing isn't gonna happen. I've worked too hard. Something amazing that hasn't happened is coming. And when you get yourself into that mindset, it creates a sense of resilience and momentum and resolve that you need in order to keep going when the shit hits the fan or when you feel disappointed or when life is beating you down. And that was the other gift of that moment Mm -hmm. is developing a little tool to flip my mindset when I wanted to start to feel sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. Throw the timeline out, divorce yourself from expectations, double down on that belief and maintain your like adherence to just moving forward and action. Yeah. So much easier to say than to do. That's why I focus on tools because we all know what to do. It's the how. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we start to talk about the self, the quote unquote, like self-help or self-improvement space, you start to hear words like, you know, motivation and inspiration and how do I find my purpose? And we need to be living with passion. And I, I just think for the most part, it does more harm in good than good in the sense that it confuses people. And I think it makes people feel bad about where they are in the moment Mm. because it often lacks any kind of practicality. Like it's sort of a measuring tool, like, oh, I don't have passion or I don't know what my purpose is. Like I must not have self-worth. All these other people seem all fired up and excited. And here I am little me over here. And I'm like, you become a shrinking flower. And so I think the vernacular around it, like I want you, I'm saying this because I want you to help me make sense of it for the person who's listening or watching, who is in that place, who's struggling with the idea of, of how to move forward and how to make sense of the idea of self-empowerment and self-improvement. Yeah, so that brings us to the high five habit, which is gonna sound so stupid. <laughs> More stupid. You know, this is my brand I've come to realize. <laughs> I know, yeah. If it sounds stupid and it's backed by science, it's something Mel Robbins mm-hmm. wants to talk about. So the high five habit um, is for all of us, but particularly if you're somebody that feels stuck or you're easily tripped up or brought down by jealousy or guilt or procrastination or beating yourself up or comparison. And you know, honestly, if you're breathing, that's you. <laughs> we all, who isn't? Yeah. Um, This is an idea that once I unpack it for you, you're gonna literally go, holy shit. In a good way? Yes. All right, lay on me. So we all know that we need to love ourselves, right? How do you do that? Mm. I don't know. What is the action that you take? Yeah, we all know we're supposed to accept ourselves. We all know we're supposed to uh, have self-esteem and self-worth and self-validation and self-confidence. How do you build it? And you know, the other thing is, is that we also are looking outside ourselves for confirmation, validation, affirmation of those things. 
And so how do you relocate the source of your self-confidence, self-esteem, self-worth, self-validation within yourself so that you're in control of it? Big idea, right? So uh, let me tell you the story about how I discovered this because it was not like a, oh, how do I have another high five moment? You mm-hmm. know, I get fired from my talk show and I uh, am essentially fired from my dream job. I then start having speech after speech after speech after speech cancel. Then Houghton Mifflin cancels my contract for my next book and asks for me to return money that I've long spent. And why'd they cancel it? Because just because of pandemic related. They laid off there are two reasons. First of all, they were they were laying off 45% of the staff, but more importantly, let me take responsibility. I was a year late on delivering a manuscript. Okay, Okay, so let's be honest. I fucked up yet again. I ghosted my publisher and they fired my ass um, as they should. The long play to ghost your publisher, (laughs) right? (laughs) I'm gonna spend your money and then ghost you. Um, But I found myself again in this like familiar place having sort of echoes back to a decade ago of, oh my God, are we in financial free fall again? Like is this ride over? Mm-hmm. Kids come I mean, home. You did like a hundred speeches in a year prior to that yep. or prior to the show. Yep. And then took a pay cut to do the show. Yep. And look, I, I've been saving money. I've been very smart about, about money now that I've made it. We've paid back all of our debt, something we're both really, really proud of. Um, and at the same time, when the shit hits a fan in your life, your old things will get triggered. And mm-hmm. what got triggered for me is I'm about to lose it all again. Right. Meanwhile, just like everybody else on the planet, your kids come home and it's both a blessing and a horror show to have your children in a state of distress as the world is in distress. And I just started to feel overwhelmed. And there was this one morning where um, I walked into the bathroom And I was standing in my underwear, brushing my teeth in front of the mirror. And I looked up at the mirror and my first thought was, ugh. I noticed that my jowls were starting to look like saddlebags on a pack horse at the Grand Canyon. (laughs) And uh, I had like these crazy lines by my eyes and my neck was really like kind of saggy and one boob was hanging lower than the other and my gray hair was coming in. And I, and as soon as I started kind of critiquing my thoughts or my, my looks and appearance, then my mind rich started going, fuck, I didn't get that email back to that person. And I got that presentation I need to do. And my God, did that speech just cancel again? What the fuck am I going to do? And I look down and the dog needs to be walked. And then I think I I got a zoom call in nine minutes. Like I got to get my shit together. And before I knew it, my whole mood was low. I felt overwhelmed. I had taken myself down mentally. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mel, you got, it's gonna be okay. Like you got this girl, like mm-hmm. it's lift your head up. You can handle this. I don't know what came over me, Rich. This is pathetic. But standing there in my underwear in front of my bathroom sink, I raised my hand and high five my reflection. And I cracked a smile because it's so fucking corny. I even thought of that guy, Stuart Smiley from the SNL skip. Mm-hmm. So remember that I'm nice, I'm kind, yeah. people like me. Went on with my day. That was it. Snapped a photo though. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Mm-mm. Not the first time. And then I kept doing it. I did it probably for a week or two. And here's the weird thing about it. I started when I woke up after doing this high five your own reflection in the mirror thing, I actually started to feel like I was looking forward to it. And here's why, you know, I've spent a lifetime just like you standing in front of the mirror. And what I realize now is that when I'm standing in front of a mirror, I'm either critiquing Mm -hmm. or picking myself apart or I'm ignoring myself. And when you start to high five your own reflection, it starts to build a partnership within you with yourself. When you walk into the bathroom and you see your reflection and you've been greeting it, it's like seeing another person. It's the strangest thing. You start to realize how often you fucking ignore or destroy yourself when you see yourself or beat yourself up. And here's what's also crazy. You have a lifetime, and this is where the science gets wacky and I'm gonna hit you with so much science because this stuff is so cool. You have a lifetime positive association 
with high-fiving other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. As a runner, as a racer, you have gotten so many high fives, Rich. What does a high five say to you when somebody gives you one? You feel seen, you feel appreciated, you feel energized by it. And it's, a, it's an exchange of energy. It's not the same, and you talk about this in the book, it's not the same as like self-talk because there's a participation involved in it. There's like a communion yes. aspect to it. Yeah, and you know, if you think about it, you're so good at celebrating, seeing, and cheering for other people in your life. You plan birthday parties, you reach out to people when you're worried about them, you help out colleagues, you cheer for your favorite sports teams, you high five people like Rich as they're running races past you, you buy people's merchandise, you do all kinds of stuff for other people, but nobody's taught you how to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why it feels fucking weird to high five your own reflection is because you've been taught to do the opposite. Why is the default to just beat ourselves down like that? I mean, it is crazy. We would never treat anyone else in our lives, especially the people we care about, the way that we treat ourselves in terms of the self-talk or the narrative or the critique or the you know the, the the kind of harshness with which we you know judge our appearances our behavior the way we you know think back on things that we said the other day and just are horrified by our own selves and it's i don't know if it's everybody but everybody it's most people except for buddhists i mean i yeah. think that they're like like if you're a big practicing buddhist that's a monk right that's like just why kind can't of the default be the good things though well, you know, I why yeah, is it wired that way? You know why? Way? There's a there's cognitive bias. There's a there's a bias towards mm -hmm. negativity, uh, and it's a protection mechanism. That's a default from evolution. That if you remember the bad shit, you're more likely to spot it when it happens in right. the future. So you can avoid it. And here's where I think it begins. I believe my theory is that it begins two places. Either you, or that could be both. Actually, you either learned the pattern of beating yourself up because you had parents or caregivers that were hard on themselves or hard on you. And so as a child, you absorb that pattern and you now repeat it and you don't even realize it. So those moments you're like, oh my God, I sound just like my dad or my mom. That is an example of a pattern that you've absorbed. Mm -hmm. So particularly for women, we've watched our mothers be critical about their appearance. We've watched our mothers ignore and criticize themselves in the mirror. And so we learn that from our caregivers. So that's one place. The second place that we learn it is when the drive in your life becomes fitting in. Fitting into groups in elementary, middle, high school, college, your neighborhood, that feels safe when you fit in. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. And I believe a lot of the negative self-talk is a sorting hat type of mentality yeah. that we do to ourselves going, I can't be with those people. I can't be with those people. It's safe to be with those people. And you start to see yourself and the world around you as places where you belong and places where you don't. And part of the criticism, as fucked up as it sounds, that we engage in all the time is don't be too big, don't be too loud, don't show yourself too much, don't have blue hair, don't do this, other people won't like you. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected, but the truth is you develop a habit of fucking rejecting yourself. Right, meanwhile, you're further divorcing yourself from who you truly are because you're not Correct. giving yourself permission to be yourself. That gets sublimated in favor of fitting in and you know, accommodating other people and acclimating your behavior around what will be approved of. Yes. So for me, um, I, you know, I have clearly a lifetime of beating myself up and tearing myself down and regretting decisions that I made. And in the middle of stumbling through life, instead of being like, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay. Being like, you're really fucked up now, Mel. How does that help? Right. How does criticizing and, and being hard on yourself help? You know, what's interesting is I even think of somebody like David Goggins, right? Everybody looks at him and can't hurt me. Tough, 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 mentally tough. His single biggest mindset trick is the cookie jar. Mm -hmm. It's reaching into your mind to find a positive thing that's worth fighting through the bullshit for. It still comes down to encouragement and support and something positive. Mm -hmm. And so to me, the coolest thing about the high five is this. First of all, I am demanding that you try it, especially if you think it's stupid as hell. I want you to stand in front of the mirror 
Number one, because research out of Harvard says taking a moment of reflection with yourself in the morning and setting an intention changes your productivity. It changes your neurochemistry. It changes how you show up for the day. It changes everything. That's number one. Number two, you have a lifetime of looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing what you hate. I wanna change that. When you raise your hand and high five your own reflection, because you have been raising your hand and high fiving other people for your entire life, it is already programmed into your subconscious. All of that shit that's positive, I believe in you, we got this, come on, shake it off, let's get going, here we go. I see you, I hear you, I celebrate you. All that stuff you've been doing for other people, when you raise that hand, the subconscious part of your brain kicks in and it overrides mm -hmm. all of the negative stuff you think. You cannot stand in front of that mirror, Rich, and go, God, I look fat and high five yourself. <laughs> it's impossible. Your brain can't right. do it. Right. You also can't think about work emails. You also can't think about what's stressing you out. And here's the thing that I also love about it. So this is a field of study called neurobics. You're marrying right. physical movement with a change in thought. The other thing that I- It's like neurology aerobics. It is. Basically. It's exactly what it is. I found that part of the book fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, you're taking this very simple action that we all associate with positive things that's backed up by you know the neurochemistry um, with this mirror work, which has, a tradition in psychology in the field of like cultivating self love. It's not like like the idea of looking in the mirror and doing the Stuart Smalley thing. Like there's science and research behind this yeah. to cultivate appreciation for the self. Yes. And so there's even more here. So the other stuff that's super cool about this is that, you know, we've all bought into this lie that somehow beating yourself up and tough love and being hard on yourself is motivating. Wrong. All the research shows that it is demotivating. If you're somebody that's stuck, if you're somebody that has regrets, if you're somebody that is tired of where you are, if you feel like, you know, you just, why can't I change? Beating yourself up is making it worse. You have to learn how to cheer for yourself where you are. Because if you're not, you will never find the motivation to change. So they did this study with kids where they broke kids into three different groups, okay? And they gave the kids very challenging problems. And they wanted to know what was going to be the thing that researchers could do to motivate and inspire kids to work through a challenging problem. And what is gonna be the most effective thing that we could do to mm -hmm. give somebody that boost that you need to really face something that's hard. So group number one got the old fixed mindset praise where it's like, hey, you're super smart, Rich. Hey, Rich, you're really good looking in those glasses and I bet they help you make you focus on this problem. Keep going, buddy. The second group got the fixed mindset praise, which is, hey, Rich, you're really, really working hard. Rich, that perseverance is amazing. Keep going. The third group, they got a simple high five. No words, just a high five. The group with the simple high five outperformed the other two group and then some. That's why? so crazy. Why? I'll tell you why. A high five is fulfilling your fundamental emotional needs. It's not about the problem. When you high five somebody, including yourself, you are affirming that somebody exists. You are saying, I see you and you're 